baby, have you seen my other heel? I sat kneeling in front of my closet. Sliding doors pushed to the side. I shoved various shoes this way and that, hoping to glimpse a hint of red in the chaos. One lonely scarlet pump sat at my side, lacking its mate. Frustration swelled my chest and left me groaning as I threw yet another sneaker out of the way. Babe! Huh? My husband Max poked his head through the door. He was already dressed. Had been for hours. I had to admit he looked good in his slick black slacks and dark blue button-up. Freshly shaven. Hair a little overgrown in a way that added more charm rather than appearing messy. Oh, and don't forget the polished leather loafers that fit snugly around his feet. I'd have appreciated the sight more if we weren't already 15 minutes late. My heels, the red pair. I lifted the lone shoe up as an example. I can't find the left one anywhere. I could hear my own voice take on a hysterical edge. This was the first work dinner I'd been invited to since I started at the company two years ago. My first chance to brush eyebrows with the bigwigs. Show them I was worthy of the promotion I'd applied for a few months back. And here I was about to blow it, all because of a stupid shoe. I could feel the tears welling up in my eyes as Max came up behind me. Jumping into problem solving mode. The second he saw me crumbling. Hey now, it's alright, we'll find them. He knelt down next to me, rubbing the small of my back and glancing over me into the mess of the closet before us. I could feel him stiffen, my own sense of hopelessness washing over him as well. God bless him though, he kept a straight face. Is there... is there any other pair you could wear? To put it plainly, my closet was a disaster. I knew it. He knew it. Hell, even the cat didn't venture in there anymore. Despite the fact I wore one of three pairs of sandals on a daily basis, I was a sucker for a good deal, and an even bigger sucker for a good shoe. They piled up in my closet like a precarious mountain. The eventual landslide and even present threat. Of course, when I actually need a pair, they were nowhere to be found. It was my fault for not checking earlier. These last few weeks had been such a haze at work. I'd barely had time to purchase a new dress at all. The second I saw the silky scarlet number though, I'd known I had the perfect pair of shoes to match it at home already. I'd never even worn them. Maybe I never would. What about these? Max pulled out a strappy black sandal with gold embellishments running along the sides. It wasn't what I pictured, which made my throat dry. But for the sake of immediacy, I gave a solemn nod in agreement. He dug in to find the other. Soon his brows pinched together on his forehead. Shoot, I don't see this one either. Before I could melt down completely, he got me up off the floor and ushered me towards the living room. It took some convincing, but eventually, I slid my feet into the simple black flats that sat on the mat by our door. And we were on our way. A bunch of old suits wouldn't be staring at my feet, he assured me. I bit my lip to hold back any argument bubbling to the surface and instead focused on coming up with an excuse for running late. They didn't revolve around footwear. All went well. We weren't the only stragglers, in fact. Fashionably late seemed to be the name of the game. We laughed. We joked. We stayed out far too late. It was an easier night than I thought it'd be, particularly with a glass or two of white wine warming my belly and bringing a delicate flush to my cheeks. 
I hadn't imagined I'd get along with my higher up so well. When they asked my opinion on an upcoming case, I knew I had it in the bag. By the time we made it home, I was stumbling through the door. Max helped me into the bedroom, the world blurring in a delightful, boozy haze. I collapsed onto our pillow top mattress, my fancy red dress pulling up around my hips. By the morning, it'd be a wrinkled mess, but I didn't have the energy needed to fight that reality. He slipped the flats off my feet, and the last thing I heard before consciousness slipped away for me was a thump as he tossed them into the closet. I woke up the next morning, immediately regretting the fact I opened my eyes in the first place. Not only was the headache debilitating, my throat was so dry it felt like it was full of cotton. Jesus, when was the last time I had that much wine? I rubbed my mascara stained eyes and spent the next 20 minutes trying to find the will to live. It wasn't until I peeked over at the nightstand and saw a few tablets of aspirin and a glass of water that I finally dared swing my feet to the floor. I could smell the coffee in the distance. I hope it hadn't sat out for too long. But at that point, beggars can't be choosers. I slipped the dress up over my head and staggered to the closet. It was only then that the memory of missing shoes came back to me. I sank to the ground and crossed my legs, digging back into the pile now that I had some time and space between my frustration. I paused as my attention caught a singular shoe sitting on the top, one of the flats I wore last night, sitting all by its lonesome. I started yanking each shoe out one by one laying them in a circle around me as I went. Once I finally reached the beige carpet at the bottom, my suspicions had been confirmed. There were 20 shoes total, and not one of them had the left side of its pair. Hey sleepyhead, Max's voice called from down the hall. Still alive in there? His head poked through the door, and right away his brow raised. I must have been quite a sight sitting there half naked, dismantling my closet. The thought hardly occurred to me though. Instead, my cheeks began to flush as a round of anger peeked over my half-drunken daze. This isn't funny, Max, I snapped, pulling myself back up on my unsteady feet. Where are they? What are you talking about? My shoes, Max, where did you put my shoes? He always complained when I came home with a new pair. It was one of the few things we actually argued about, point made, but I couldn't believe he'd stoop to this level just to make it. He rolled his eyes. I didn't do anything with your shoes, Piper. I only then realized that he was still dressed in his suit. No, a different suit, with a red shirt instead. He had a suitcase in his left hand. Where are you going? I asked. My trip, he explained slowly, like he was talking to a child rather than his already enraged wife, to San Antonio. That's today? I forgot entirely. I wasn't sure what was worse. My gut screaming at me that he had something to do with my missing shoes, or the fact we didn't have time to argue about it. Yeah, Piper, that's today. His annoyance was palpable, but still, he stepped forward to give me a kiss on the forehead. I've gotta go. I'll help you look for them when I get back, alright? Alright, I mumbled, sitting back on the floor. I heard his footsteps carrying him down the stairs and the front door swinging shut behind him. An hour later, I'd pulled myself together as well as I could. I took a shower had coffee and forced down a couple pieces of burnt toast and peanut butter to settle my stomach. It wasn't until my phone lit up later that afternoon that my guilt over getting too drunk and picking a fight started to fade. It was a text from my boss. Apparently everyone loved me. 
This gave me the motivation I needed to slip into my workout clothes and grab my old pair of sneakers by the door. A run would surely get me feeling like myself again, sweating out the last remnants of poison pouring throughout my veins. I sat my shoes down on my dresser and tugged open the sock drawer. Just like that, the horrible gnawing feeling in my gut was back. Not misplaced anger this time, or twisting nausea. It was as if ice had seeped into my insides and frozen into sharp, uncomfortable spikes. I always sorted my socks when I did laundry, rolled them into matching pairs so they were easier to grab. But every sock in my drawer was loose. I shoved it closed, rushing down to my cell phone in the living room and shooting off a text to Max. This really isn't funny now. I'm freaking out. Please tell me. I won't even be mad. What did you do with all my socks and shoes? I paced along the worn carpet until I heard my phone buzz again. Your socks? Seriously? Honey, why would I do something with your socks? We'll talk when I'm home. I let go of a breath that I didn't know I'd been holding. A long, frustrated sigh. He was right. This was ridiculous. I couldn't imagine a single reason he'd hide my stuff. It wasn't something he'd ever done before. As annoyed as he was of my ever-growing collection, he'd never given me a reason to think he'd disrespect my belongings. I shouldn't have blamed him. But what other option could there be? I spent the rest of the day tearing the house apart. Cupboards, guest closets, hell, I dug through the storage tubs we had stacked up in the basement. No sign of any of it. Not a single shoe or a missing sock in sight. As the sun began to dip below the sky, I turned my mind to plan B. We had a security system in the house since we bought it. But honestly, it wasn't something I put much mind to myself. Max was the one who handled any of the alerts, all of which were false alarms to this point. But I found our account information hidden away in his desk and gave them a call. One frustrating conversation later, I wasn't any further along than where I started. The alarm was in perfect working order and nothing suspicious showed on its history. By the time that was over, I was equal parts hungry and exhausted. My whole day was gone to a strange mystery that I was no closer to solving. I grabbed a pack of crackers and crawled into bed, nibbling half-heartedly on them until my mind started to drift away. I'm not sure what time it was when my eyes fluttered open once more. All I knew was that it was dark. Only the briefest flicker of street lamps, sending an eerie glow through our window. The house was quiet, except for the air conditioner humming softly in the background. I yawned and stretched my legs out towards the edge of the bed. And then I froze. Something was wrapped around my left ankle. There it was again, that frozen dread is seeping out inside of me. It started in my gut and spilled out into my arms and legs, forcing them down with an invisible weight. I hadn't been sure what had woken me at first, but now it was clear. Something had grabbed me. It was still there. I didn't want to look. Everything inside of me screamed for me not to, to instead tuck myself under the covers until morning came. A leftover survival mechanism from my childhood that apparently never faded. If I ignored it, then maybe, just maybe, it would go away. Adult problems weren't that simple though. Besides, I'd passed out on top of the comforter. All there was was me and whoever was holding on to me. Tears strung to my eyes. I breathed in deep and then I looked down. An unintentional gasp left my lips, violent and fearful. I'd expected a man to be towering over my bed, 
bathed in shadows, gun in hand, but what I saw was so much worse. It wasn't towering at all, instead perched up on the foot of my bed, held up by its elbows as one hand wrapped around me. The light beam hit its arms perfectly, illuminating thick yellow claws nearly an inch long. Its skin was so pale and it almost glowed, except for the spots of dirt that stained its arms and torso. Its face was the last thing that came into view, and that was when a scream started to rise in my throat. Its eyes were just as yellow and gnarled as its claws, sitting diagonally on its ashen face. It doesn't have a nose, instead its second eye was set in the groove where a nose should have been. Its mouth hung open, sharp canines in the front that became shorter and thicker further into its jaw. Its tongue flicked through the gap in its front teeth, landing wetly against the base of my foot. My scream tore loose. I kicked with my free leg, the blow connecting with the side of its head and leaving it faltering backward. Its hand tightened around me, a terrible noise springing from its maw. It was laughing, giggling at me. I pulled against it with all my might, kicking and screaming and flailing wildly to get it off. It held tight. I was no match for the strength in that single appendage. Soon, I was sliding forward, up off the foot of the bed and onto the bedroom floor. I hit with a yelp, pain shooting from my tailbone, up into my neck. The impact stunned me for a moment, but by the time I came to again, we were heading towards the stairs. No, I screamed, twisting to grab the bathroom door frame as we passed it. Again, the creature giggled darting up on top of me and straddling my waist. It moved like an ape, settling in on its haunches and using its arms to balance itself. It flashed a toothy grin my way and raised a hand high up in the air. The blow connected with my nose. A crack echoed off the walls and blood seeped into my open mouth. My arms went weak. It grabbed my ankle once more and tugged me onward. Soon, I was sliding down the stairs, head bouncing against them like a rubber ball. A new sound tore from my lips, a weak, pitiful whine. I tried to grab a hold of the railing, but I couldn't make my fingers listen to my half-hearted commands. We hit the landing and took a left. It was leading me towards the kitchen. It dropped me once I'd crossed the threshold onto the ivory bright tile. It stood up on its hind legs, hopping over to the stove, as if it knew this place well, as if it had been there before. It reached up towards the knife block and grabbed a large, sharpened blade from the set. No, I cried again, shoving numbly against the ground. My head ached worse than the hangover, worse than anything I'd ever felt before. Everything was distant, disconnected, yet somewhere in the deep fog that had settled within me, the reality of the situation was all too apparent. I was going to die. I'd barely made it up on my hands before the creature approached me again, tilting its head as it took in the sight of me. It was a hungry sort of look, similar to the one that some of the partners from my firm had given me the night before. I'd enjoyed it then, being wined and dined by them. There'd been a power in it, an advantage. I felt nothing of the sort now. The look was directed firmly at my foot, its arm lifted and fell before I could mutter another languid protest, another scream. The blade dug into my ankle, 
cutting expertly through the skin and muscle, only stopped short as it met the bone. The world tilted, my vision turned red, it tugged the blade back, meeting resistance as it stayed wedged inside of me. It laughed again, the terrible noise rising in pitch as it shifted to pull again. It was almost worse when the blade was leaving, a gurgling noise seeped from my throat. Once the knife was free, it was tossed to the side. My ankle was lifted delicately, lovingly to its lips. Its tongue darted out again, dipping it into the crimson blood that was leaked from the wound. Bile stung my esophagus. I twisted hopelessly against its grip. The last thing I remembered is its jaws clamping down on the bone. Then everything went black. I woke up in the hospital a day later, bandages wrapped tightly around the stump of my leg, and Max hunched over in the chair next to me, tears streaking his face, still wearing the now wrinkled red shirt that he left in. He embraced me, begged me for details, I wasn't sure what to say. The neighbors had heard me screaming and called the police. By the time they'd made it there, and busted down the door, the creature was nowhere to be found. I was a bloody mess on the floor, barely clinging to life. A trail of blood led down the basement stairs to a patch of loose dirt and cement at the end of a supply closet. They never found my foot. I don't imagine they ever will. Life slowly returned to normal, as normal as it could be after what I went through. I told everyone it was just an intruder, a sick, twisted individual that I didn't recognize. I insisted on selling the house. Max agreed without argument. We threw out every shoe I owned during the move, and I only bought two more pairs to get me through day-to-day -day life. I keep them in the living room at all times. Max thinks I should see a therapist. He's probably right. I'm scared that if I do, I'll open up about everything, tell the whole truth. I'm not sure I can, not out loud, but I'm adjusting, I'm living. That's the most I can hope for. Max is supportive and our new home is lovely. That's all I need, or at least I thought so. Now, I'm not so sure, because this morning I realized my right sneaker wasn't by the door where I left it.